Well, good uh, afternoon. I'm uh, Gary Goff, substituting for Jim Hodson, who's at uh, multiple, multiple meetings. And so we're still going to do our Facebook Live. Jim will be absent. We're going to talk about the F-105 uh, for a little bit. The F-105 Thud is going to be used as our simulator for John Ezro. And John Ezro, tell me a little bit about John. What did you do at General Dynamics? And uh, such that we're going to look at the inside of a 105 to be able to have you explain it. Well, I worked for a short time in product support engineering, and then I went on to design engineering. When you say design engineering, what does that mean? Well, our group was responsible for the fuel system design on F-16, YF-22, F-22. And the fuel system design, that's really what we're here for, is to talk about it. We're going to go talk about this inside the uh, F-105 in what uh, we affectionately call a bomb bay because <laughs> it held a nuclear bomb back in the day. But what we like about it is it's going to have all these things inside the belly of this airplane that John is going to talk about from a very interesting standpoint. And that should get rid of a lot of the noise. <laughs> and so. <laughs> So when you're designing a fuel system and you design it, I assume you go to some board or something like that? What do you do when you design the fuel system? Well, you're going to start out with a schematic. The fuel system has certain requirements. So it's got to make sure, make sure that fuel is always available to the engine. <laughs> and then it has some other things that have to go along with that. So you start with the layout of the system, and then eventually you proceed to where you have to actually fit it into an aircraft somewhere. Now, if it's a brand new aircraft, how do you, quote, fit it into an aircraft if it's like brand spanking new? Well, the airplane will be defined as far as the shape and its size, and then all these systems have to fit in that available space. And so, when, when you say systems that have to fit, we're going to look at right over here and, like, tell me, like, just for our viewers, because, well, and pilots too, we don't know, <laughs> what is all this stuff? that's running through the aircraft that obviously I need to keep flying the airplane that I'm really glad you know how to build. So right here we have some hydraulic lines and you can see the identifier here for hydraulics. This little color-coded tab on it. Oh, interesting. And here's another one for fuel system. So red is fuel then. So that will tell you, you know, what these tubes are for, which system they're associated with. Now here's an interesting one up here. This is a drain. Let's see if I can get up there and yeah. see it. Uh, okay. So different systems have different identifiers, color and also the symbols. So here's some hydraulics. You can see a little clearer. All right. I'm, I'm working the camera here, guys. Give me time. I'm working the camera. All right. There it is. Okay. So now there's all the hydraulic lines coming out. So now, and there's another fuel line too, because <laughs> right. I can see the red, That's so that right. means fuel, exactly. right? Exactly. So, so when, you're, when you've got the schematics or the blueprints or whatever it is of the aircraft, and you start um, designing how to run this fuel, because you can see there obviously were some modifications made with these two fuel lines right here, because you can see the residue. I mean, do you, like when you design it, is that it, or does it change a lot, or I mean, how do you how do you put all this stuff in an airplane? That's where the integration comes in. So designing a system to start with is easy, but then fitting it in with everybody else's. There's only so much real estate in here. There's right. only so much space. Right. Everybody has to fit. It isn't like okay, we were here first, so no one else can be here. <laughs> no, there's a lot of compromises, a lot of give and take, because the hydraulic has to run in here, the fuel has to run in here, the hot air duct for the bleed air off the engine, yeah. that needs its space. And then you got all the wiring too, exactly. in addition to all the wiring, exactly. to one, to make the fuel pumps work, or the hydraulic pumps, or the right. door pumps, or whatever it is, all that stuff to work. Um, when, when you, do you go to like meetings and that's where you find out, hey, by the way, we're going to run this line and the hydraulic guys are a bunch of jerks and they're going to take over the airplane and you've got to go around and put your fuel system around because they have more power. You're nodding your head, yes. So, a lot of meetings. <laughs> this is yeah. true. In the old days, you know, we had mock-ups and that's where things would actually be run. 
and it was a fuel system designer you could go and look and see where the hydraulic lines were already and then you could see if you could have space to accommodate you know your system that sounds like a smart idea and nowadays though we don't have any hard mock-ups it's all done on computers so you guys talk to each other all the time we have to because you've got to figure out who's putting what where exactly and somebody changes something you know late in the day and then you come in the next day and then something's different I mean what what about the um, uh, what is it called the the owner of the airplane the, the, they come in and say hey by the way we want to add this to the airplane does that happen a lot <laughs> changing requirements always a problem mission creep mission creep I've heard that term before yeah mission creep so on, on the design side we have something similar yeah really and and is the Air Force easy to work with as a contractor? Well, anybody who's ever worked with contractors knows what that, what that is like. You have an idea in your mind of what you want things to be. The person doing the work, they have an idea of how it's gonna happen. Hopefully you can come to some agreement and understanding. But you know, think of it from the customer's perspective. At the start, they have this set of requirements and the contractor says, yes, we'll do that. But then from there on, oh, we can't do that. We have to do this. Oh, we don't have that. We must do it this way. So the, the customer starts out here, and then he's always giving up stuff, right? Oh, so the like the Air Force is the customer, yeah. and they're having to give up, uh, capa not capability as much as maybe real estate or whatever it is. Sometimes capability. Really? Yeah, things, things can't fit where they need to fit things the airplane has to get bigger has to get heavier you lose performance yeah well yeah, yeah. if it gets heavier it's yeah. definitely gonna lose performance right. how, how do you design these the fuel system here for a, a fighter like this that can that can easily uh, would have been able to pull seven seven and a half G's to the f-15 that I flew that was pulling nine G's and all the airplanes now pull nine G's how do you know how to design this stuff so that it can stay there you just know well we have people that analyze the loads and understand what's going to happen when the airplane is actually flying and operating under those conditions temperatures pressures uh, G loads all that has to be taken into account and that explains a lot of how things are mounted okay that explains a lot of why things are safety wired because you don't want them to come apart in the service. Yeah, that would, that would not be right. good. That would not be good. So the way things are held in place and supported. Oh, because they're gonna, they're gonna, um, they could easily bounce around or if you're pulling the G's, they could actually bend down and start uh, chafing. Because we sway. talked about the earlier, chafing on this thing. Or sway. and. and so you lay it out and on the ground, this is right here like this. Right. Well, in, in actual service under loads, you know, this, this may be shift a little bit. And you have oh. to account for all that. Holy cow. And, and I know that um, during the Vietnam combat where the uh, 105s were flying in and out, and they did not carry the nuclear bomb. Uh, the guys in uh, Europe flying 105s did because they sat nuke alert. Mm -hmm. This is a, a fuel tank that was sitting right here. That was a mod where they added the fuel tank in here so you, you extend your range. So the 390 gallons? Something like that. Yeah. That's a lot, of, filled, a lot of tank. Filled this space up. Yep, filled this space. So here's where the air would go in and out of the tank and the larger line is where the fuel would go in and out of the tank. And, and so do you, do you get the call from the the customer, the Air Force guy, saying, "Hey, we need to put a fuel tank in here," and then because that's your department is fuel. Do you guys redesign this thing, or is this like done on the fly in the field? Because I mean, obviously, when I look at this thing, I see this, there's stuff here. That's a I would assume a fuel pump or something. I don't know. I'm Looks not like smart. A shutoff valve. A shutoff valve. Yeah. You know, you got to put this thing in, and it's it's bolted in here, and then here's the modifications, and that's gr a nice weld across there. Uh, do you design that, or does the field operator just go and make it? Normally, that would be a factory design. So you would get the call. Yeah. 
hey John, uh, we need you to do a modification where we can haul, because we can hang it, it's easy to hang right there because that's where the nuke hung, right, right there's the hanger, right. so you can hang it in there, that's easy, and then you get the call saying, hey, we've got to figure out a way to make it work. That's right, so all that plumbing has to be put in, has to find real estate to actually put the tubes in to route the fuel in the air in and out of the tank. And deconflict de with yeah. all the other stuff that's in this airplane. When, when you design all this stuff and, and you go through all the process, do you get to see it in the jet? in the field or are you just having to work on the next set of systems? Well normally there has to be a fit check done. Somewhere okay. an aircraft will be modified okay. with, with this to make sure that it does work. To make sure that there's space for other systems to also be in that nearby real estate. Yeah, That all has to be figured out. Um, if you have a mock-up you can do it that way. If it's uh, done on computer with uh, three-dimensional modeling, you, you would do it that way. But somewhere, one airplane has to be tried out with that. And normally the design group would be involved in ensuring that that modification goes like it's supposed to go, that it can be accomplished. Yeah. Do you, when you started doing a lot of, I mean, like how did you get involved to do this? I mean. Did you like as a kid say, "Oh, I want to be a fuel designer of airplanes"? I mean, how how did you how did you get from growing up to you know what? I think this is something I could do. How did you get, how did you get here? <laughs> well, everybody's path is different, but mine was I was always interested in airplanes. Didn't know if I wanted to be a pilot or whatever, and I didn't understand much of what went on behind the scenes to make all this work. So when I graduated high school, I went and got my airframe and power plant license. Okay, your A and P, right? So I, okay. That's right. So my A and P license introduced me to how things are maintained and operated in the field. And I, I saw that and I said, well, I'm more interested in how it got there. So the engineering part uh, of how you design it to be operated in the field. And I just happened to get hired into General Dynamics in 1980 and they needed people working on fuel system product support engineering. So that was field support for the fuel system. So that was okay. kind of in between. That was in between an A and P and design engineering. And I saw enough of that that after being in product support for about seven years, I transferred over to design engineering. And when you say field and support, uh, does that mean you're out with a squadron of airplanes and you're there to make mods or something? What does a field and support mean that you did for seven years? Well. It's actually a two-part job. We had people stationed at the bases with the airplanes. Right. So when the shop had a problem, they couldn't fix it, they would ask our local field service representative at the base. So he would help them out, and if he could solve the problem, great. If there was no solution that he could come up with, then he would contact the factory, and that was us. Wow. And you're the only person out there that knows this stuff. Well, no. In the F-16 group, we had two or three of us working fuel system. And in the design group, uh, there's actually more than that. There's I would think in the design group, there's yeah. a lot. Yes. A lot. Especially back in the day when all the uh, design work was done by hand. You know, before we had computers, we had drafting boards and we had to make paper drawings. Really? So On the F-16? You're with. kidding. Well, it was back in the, in the 70s. Oh my gosh, I didn't so realize that. we changed over later to three-dimensional modeling, but even then you need several people to work the, uh, the software. So, you know, for an airplane like this, the fuel system group was probably 10, 12 people. And how did you pick fuel system over I don't know, hydraulic system? See, I could have gone either way. Like I said, when I got in there, they needed somebody to work fuel. It's like, yeah, fuel's good. I can do that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I yeah, can do that. That's right. So it was just a place to start. And then you decided, oh, well, now I've got the hang of it. I might as well stay here until you're done working fuel systems. Nothing wrong with fuel. Nothing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's very well needed. Trust me, for those who've gotten short on fuel. <laughs> yes, yeah, you that? need fuel. 
It isn't like we're trying to put something on the pilots that they don't like. No, no, no. We we like fuel. We yeah. we need it. Unless you're on fire, that's about the only time you don't like it. Well, it now, as a as a, a young man, and you just said, "Hey, I just really like airplanes." So, like, did you go to like a trade school? Did you go to a college? Did you go to a uh, business place. How how did you get your A and P to start this journey that you've been on? Well, my high school was actually a college prep high school. Okay. So I, I started out on that path, and then towards the end of my high school career, I was more interested in the trade aspect. So I, I was able to go to a, a school, North Institute of Technology, where they taught an A and P course. So that's about two thousand hours. Wow. And they, they treat it just like a job. You punch it in in the morning, you punch it out in the afternoon, eight hours a day. Wow. Half class time, and then half was practical time. So your practical time, then you worked on, at the time, probably Cessna 152, 172s, did you, yeah. or was it bigger airplane? It was more um, not operational equipment. Okay. So airplanes like we see here in the museum uh -huh. would be used for A&P training. Things that weren't going to fly. Uh, that weren't going to fly because, yeah. yeah, you don't want a trainee fixing something that's going to go fly. I get that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm very, very, very thankful. But as we got to the more advanced courses, we actually got to work on some flyable airplanes. Wow. Dude, that's awesome. What would you recommend? Let's say you've got a 16-year-old kid out there, and he, he or she is like, eh, you know, I really like airplanes. I, I, I've seen a bunch. This sounds kind of cool. I have. Uh, I would assume you'd need fairly good math skills. Yeah. You'd need fairly good math skills. You need obviously new good computer skills. I mean, because everything's computerized now. That, that's right. So that's a given. Uh, how? What would you? What would you tell them if they were interested in this? Well, someone who's interested in how things are put together. If you'd like to take things apart and put them back together, learn how uh -huh. they work. You know, that's an indication that you would be a, a engineering candidate. When you look back in the field work, and you look back in the design work, which did you enjoy the most? The, for lack of better terms, the design academic portion, or the field uh, practical hands-on thing? I really like working with the folks in the field. You know, in my product support engineering part of my career, I was able to travel to a lot of the bases and work with the people that actually had the airplanes. So frequently, an airplane would have a problem that we couldn't fix on paper. So we had to go out and actually work with the, the customer to, to fix an airplane. So you're talking about an F-16 yeah. that's got a problem that, with the fuel system that you can't fix on paper. Wow, yeah. what would you do? Well, there's always tests you can run on the actual airplane. And you can try swapping out different pieces. There's different ways to approach troubleshooting. Wow. So. Do you pull the engine out and, and rework it there, or is it, because it, it's a tight fit in that S-16. Yeah. <laughs> There's not a lot of room. Well, you'd be surprised with the fuel tank access panels, a lot of the fuel system on the F-16 is installed inside of fuel tanks. That way, if things leak, you don't, you're not losing fuel outside. I didn't so know that. Different designs take different approaches. So you're... It, it opening up the fuel tank itself. Because that's where a lot of our, our valves were, our, our tubing. The was boost in there. pumps, all, the, all yeah. that kind of stuff. It's that, inside it, the tank. It's a, yeah, I, I know about yeah. that was inside the tank. I got yeah. that. But you still got these 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 lines here. You still got all this stuff, right? Yeah. That's got to that's got to go around the motor, which is a big. That Pratt and Whitney F100 is a big engine. And that little airplane, yeah. And that real little airplane. Because your airplane had two. Two. Airplanes. We had two. Yeah. Yep. Back in the 80s, I don't know what they fly with now, but it was a 100, I think is what it was, which is the same thing the 16 had when it yep. started. Mm -hmm. Who knows what it is now. Mm -hmm. uh, did, did you, while you're working on the fuel system and trying to get everything else, I think you have, I, I don't know, but I think you'd have to have some basic understanding of the other systems, like you were pointing out, this is a hydraulic system, this is, a, you, you have to gain some knowledge of the other things that are running in the in the jet, yeah, some general knowledge. Yeah. Wow. So, how did you acquire that general knowledge? Just in the field, or was there a class at General Dynamics to say, "Hey, you fuel guys, come in and sit on the hydraulic general 
Of course. Well, that was one of the jobs we had in product support engineering. We taught some maintenance courses. So one of the first things I did when I hired on in 1980, we were teaching the Israelis how to do maintenance on their F-16 fuel systems. Uh, is there, was there, a, I imagine there's a language barrier that you have to <laughs> overcome? Yeah, depending on the customer, yeah. yeah. Did you, did the company send you out to Israel and put you at one of the military bases there and you just kind of hung out? Or well, they actually brought them here? Their, their people here. So at General Dynamics back then, they were teaching courses to different customers. Wow. <laughs> and you're right, we would sit in the classroom, we, we'd have this PowerPoint presentation and show how the fuel system worked and what it was supposed to do. And and then different individuals in the, in the class would have a question and because of the language barrier, they would ask it through their- Translator. Well, their leader. Ah. So there were different ranks. Okay. It's like they had a, like a shop chief Okay. Think of the fuel shop chief. Yeah, yeah. And then you think of the the tech sergeants uh -huh. and staff sergeants under that, and then the, the privates. So a lot of those guys would ask that their question through them. Wow. So depending yes. on the class, we had the same thing with uh, with Koreans when we talked. That's to, right, because I remember Turks. now they got they got the F sixteen also. Oh yeah. my gosh! And yeah. they're basically it's all over the all over the world now. I mean, they're everywhere. Yeah. Last question, and we'll close it out. When you would teach this PowerPoint fuel system, um, after you got done with it, would you then take them out to the jet so that they would say, okay, and you get the hands-on, this is what I'm talking about right here. I mean, would you, would you take them out and get a hands-on to it, or was it purely a PowerPoint academic type class? depending what they purchased. Different customers wanted different things. With the Israelis, I don't recall ever going out to airplanes, but with the Pakistanis, I recall actually having an OJT on the job training type thing on the flight line where they took an airplane and used that as a teaching aid. So they would run checkout Whoa. procedures on fuel system components actually on the airplane and they got to see the results so there's a job guide, list of instructions published and tell them how to maintain the fuel system and they would go through that step by step. And we would show them under this panel, this is where that valve is. This is how you run the checkout. Yeah. Because as a pilot, I haven't got a clue what this stuff is. I, but you do, thank God. <laughs> well, <some of> <laughs> I mean, I got a basic idea of the fuel system. How did it go from the tank to the engine? That's all we knew about flying it. But F-105s, this was born before I was born. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah, born. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. But you still know what it is. Well, a lot of it hasn't changed. Right. F-16, you look inside the fuel tubes, they'll still be marked just like that. Wow. You know, when, when, cool. thing, when things work, you don't have to change them, right? <laughs> yes. That's, yeah. the, that's the idea. Any yeah. closing comments while we shut it down? Anything else? Anything that you do? Anything you'd say to a young young person that wants to come do this? Study? Absolutely. Like you said, you got to be good at math. You got to like science. You got to like mechanics. You got to like taking things apart, putting them together. Yeah. Okay. So for the Fort Worth Aviation Museum, a home of the most touchable warbirds in Texas, uh, with our special guest John Ezro, that now we should be able to hear you as opposed <laughs> to that first interview we did, and the F-105 Thud, of which my uncle flew of which I'm, I have a special love for this airplane, and um, thank God for the 105. Anyway, <clears throat> we'll sign off. You all have a great day, and be safe.